All right. Let me go ahead. I've done this before. Here we go. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, this is Greg Gurley with Friends of Cabajon Creek, and we have Abby Heilman of Isaac Walton Lake of America. She's going to do a presentation on their Salt Watch program. But before she does that, I just wanted to review the Friends of Cabajon Creek monitoring program. So our watershed runs from Rockville, Maryland, down to the Potomac River and over to uh, the edge of Bethesda and the edge of Potomac. So it's 25 square miles, 90% of it, which is urbanized, meaning that it either has houses or businesses or um, even golf courses, quite a few golf courses actually, um, within the watershed. So that leaves 10% forested and uh, grassy areas. We have no agriculture, really. So um, that's, uh, that's kind of how we're, we're set up. So our major issue is stormwater runoff. So that leads us into our uh, monitoring programs for, um, hold on. For three different areas, we have uh, bacteria, which is a new program that we just did a pilot on this summer. And uh, we're going to expand that next summer to three sites. Uh, one site up at Goya Drive, Rockville. The other site at the Locust Grove Nature Center in the middle of the watershed. And the third site down in Cabot John. So we're looking for volunteers. Um, so please ping monitoring at cavendonecreek.org if you want to volunteer uh, for that program next summer, and it requires training through the Anacostia Riverkeeper. We also have chemical teams. We trained 12 people this summer to do chemical monitoring, which is awesome. So the teams are going out uh, monthly, and we're rotating through six different teams to do our chemical monitoring, which follows the Isaac Walton Lake's um, monitoring program for chemicals. And uh, you'll hear about the chloride salts tonight as an extra program for citizen science. We also do macroinvertebrate testing to see what uh, critters are living on the bottom of, the, of our creeks. That helps us gauge the health of the creeks, uh, specifically Cabin John Creek down in Cabin John. We have that single site there. And uh, if you're not aware already, the Audubon Naturalist Society has changed their name uh, to Nature Forward. So they are our um, sponsor program for our macroinvertebrate testing. These are our bacteria results this summer. We just did August and September testing as a pilot. Um, and we had two measurements that were over the threshold of 410 based on Maryland standards. You can see September 7th shot off the charts. That was uh, had the day after it actually, uh, it actually rained that day as well when it was tested. So you can see that uh, stormwater runoff carries uh, various bacteria into the creeks, um, mostly from animals, including dogs. Um, these were reported to WSSC as well to keep an eye out for any sewage issues or sewage leaks. Um, they reported that their testing was negative for human bacteria. So uh, most of their tests find animal bacteria in uh, along the uh, watershed. And these are our macroinvertebrate results over the last three years. Um, slight increase in the number of 
of uh, macroinvertebrates that we're finding on the bottom of the creeks, which is good. Uh, that means the health is kind of steady. It's still considered fair, not good or excellent. Um, and that ties back to that 90% urbanized. We just have uh, a lot of stuff washing into the creeks. So uh, being downstream so far, uh, down county, um, we have various pollutants and things that uh, don't allow the macroinvertebrates, the very sensitive ones anyway, to thrive. So at this point, um, I want to turn it over to Abby, and uh, she can tell us about the SaltWatch program. Great, thank you, Greg. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here, and we can get started. Great. So um, as Greg said, my name is Abby Heilman. I am the Salt Watch Coordinator at the Isaac Walton League of America, which is located actually in Gaithersburg, Maryland, so not very far away um, from Cabin John Creek, both in Montgomery County. Um, and we're here today to talk about Salt Watch and the Salt Watch program. So we're currently in our sixth season of fluoride or salt watch monitoring, and we can use your help. We're looking for volunteers to monitor for fluoride runoff and to advocate for changes in salt application, distribution, and um, storage and cleanup of road salt. So some housekeeping notes. Um, I will answer some questions throughout the presentation. We're a pretty small crew tonight. Um, so feel free to ask questions um, in the chat and I'll answer them where I can. If I miss your question for some reason, I will answer them at the end of the presentation. And then I do wanna mention that I will be using the word salt and chloride interchangeably throughout the presentation. So in many areas of the United States, it's necessary to use road salt on our roadways, sidewalks, parking lots, streets to stay safe during the winter months, during um, especially inclement weather. But unfortunately, as snow and ice melt and as rain falls, a lot of that road salt ends up into our local waterways, our um, creeks and streams, and can even end up in our drinking water as well. The United States annually uses between 10 to 20 million tons of road salt every year, depending on the winter weather conditions. Um, and I do want to mention too that road or salt that's entering the environment, it doesn't just come from road salt, although that's the main source of a lot of that chloride that's going into our waterways, but it also can um, come from water softener discharge as well as wastewater discharge too. So I've been talking about road salt. What really makes up road salt? Um, here's four very common types of what we consider road salt. Sodium chloride is the most common and the least expensive of the four. There's also potassium chloride, magnesium chloride, and calcium chloride as well. And so a lot of those road salt de-icers contain that chloride within them. And a lot of salt bags, even if they're labeled as pet safe or eco-friendly, a lot of times they do still contain chloride too. And salt usage is really expensive in the United States. The immediate cost, especially of sodium chloride, is pretty low, about $73 per ton. But um, all of the impacts sort of later on, those indirect and long-term associated costs, can sometimes even add up to 15 times the purchase price and application cost of that salt. So really expensive in the long term. So how did we get started? In 2017, a fellow at the Isaac Walton League of America, he was doing just his normal um, stream monitoring. And he noticed this really big, this picture right here is actually what he noticed, this huge pile of road salt right on a roadway outside of our national office in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And this was right, this is, um, the roadway is called the Muddy Branch. and it goes over a local waterway, also called the Muddy Branch, and 
the salt pile is right next to a storm drain leading directly into the stream. So he wasn't really sure what to do in this situation. He called a couple different government officials and the city of Gaithersburg did come out and clean up the road salt. But unfortunately, um, by the time they got there and cleaned it up, the levels of chloride in the stream below reached about three times the toxic limit that the EPA has set. Um, so in 2018, we launched the Salt Watch program to um, mobilize community scientists to monitor chloride or salt levels in their local waterways and to advocate for better stream health and smarter salting practices. So the goals of Salt Watch are to raise aware in the general public about the connection between salt and stream health to identify chloride hotspots in freshwater, and to advocate for smarter application of road salt by sharing results with private landowners and local and state agencies. Um, and Greg just asked a question here, um, how good are Montgomery County salt practices for applying road salt, such as saline versus granular salt, which is a really good question. A lot of times we're seeing now brining on the roadways where they actually spray the roadways. It's called a pretreatment. And since that's a mixture with water, that's actually a lot less salt that's going into the environment. So Montgomery County, um, in the city of Gaithersburg, they're actually really good about their salt application practices, trying to reduce their amount of salt, um, because a lot of times, and we'll talk about this later, salt is very corrosive, and so it can damage a lot of our infrastructure. So the less salt that they apply to, the less um, work that they have to do later um, to fix the roadways and things too. Um, so the saline or the brining solution that they're applying is actually a really great way to reduce the amount of salt that is going into the environment. Um, also goals of Salt Watch 2, um, like Greg mentioned, we're trying to advocate for better storage um, and cleanup of road salt and just overall reducing our salt usage, um, like what's happening in Montgomery County. This is a graphic from Wisconsin SaltWise. They also have a really good program in Wisconsin. And I just put this in here because it gives a good visual of how much salt it takes to pollute some of the environment. It only takes one teaspoon of salt to permanently pollute five gallons of water. And so if you're thinking of a 50 pound bag of salt, that can actually pollute 10,000 gallons of water. And like I mentioned, salt can alter the composition of soil, slow down plant growth, and weakens the concrete, brick, and stone that make up our homes, garages, bridges, and roads. So that's more reason for local governments um, and then also private contractors to use less road salt too, because it can be very corrosive. And so again, they're going to have to replace the roadways a little bit less frequently if they're using a little bit less salt, too. Um, another good visual for you, too, a 12-ounce drinking mug, so your typical coffee cup, it actually holds enough salt to salt a 20-foot-long driveway or 10 sidewalk squares. Putting down more salt does not increase its effectiveness. It only increases the amount of salt that enters the environment. So another good visual for you. So some wildlife impacts, salt or chloride, it does affect fish, but macroinvertebrates, plankton and microbes may be even more sensitive than fish. For those of you who don't know what a macroinvertebrate is, it's a small organism such as a dragonfly larva, a caddisfly larva, crayfish, some other organisms that many people study um, including our Save Our Streams program. And then Greg mentioned that you folks study macroinvertebrates following Nature Forward's protocols, formerly Audubon Naturalist Society. And they can actually be indicators of good stream health too. Um, so the presence and sometimes absence of those macroinvertebrates can indicate some things that might be going on in the streams. And then vernal pools may be more intensely effective, affected by chloride as well as the organisms that spawn in them. A vernal pool is a seasonal pool. Um, essentially, it's caused by the um, 
seasonally occurring, usually caused by the seasonal thaw of snow and ice that sort of make up the vernal pool. And of course, as the snow and ice is melting, it might be bringing some of that chloride into those spawning or the spawning regions that things like frogs and toads and salamanders might use to produce more salamanders and toads. Um, and then also mammals may be affected too. And I bring this up as well because some deer and other organisms also use our roadways as salt licks too, which of course you don't really want a big deer licking salt off the road as you're driving by. Um, that can be pretty negatively affecting you <laughs> as a driver. And there's also drinking water impacts too from chloride. Um, Chloride is different than chlorine. It does not actually disinfect water like chloride does, or like, like chlorine does. Um, and chlorides are not typically removed at water treatment plants. It's really, really expensive to remove chloride from the water. And so most wastewater treatment plants do not remove chloride. Um, and unfortunately, that means that a lot of that water coming out of the wastewater discharge is going to be a little bit higher in chloride as a result. And that can impact public health. It's ending up in our drinking water and folks who are on low sodium diets, they might not know that they're getting extra sodium chloride in their diet from their drinking water. And as I mentioned earlier too, chlorides can be really corrosive. Um, they can also corrode our pipes. I mentioned that they corrode our roadways. They can also corrode our pipes. Chlorides were present in the Flint River in 2014 in April after road salt was applied to roadways during the winter, and that was actually one of the contributing factors in the Flint water crisis. Um, they never put anti-corrosives in their pipes after switching their water source to the Flint River, and unfortunately those chlorides corroded a lot of the lead um, out of the pipes, and, and that ended up in the drinking water of many individuals, unfortunately. So can be a pretty big impact of public health too. So what are we doing about it? Um, we historically were called Winter Salt Watch, um, as many volunteers monitored, mostly during the winter. This started as a winter organization. Um, but now we're monitoring year round. And so what we're doing is, again, we are a um, community monitoring program. So we actually send out free salt watch kits to any individuals who are interested in testing local waterways for chloride pollution, um, either seasonally or throughout the year. And so when you ask us for a chloride kit, and I'll tell you where to go after this um, at the end of this presentation, We'll send you a chloride kit, and it will include four chloride testing strips, as well as sample testing instructions, a conversion chart, which I'll go over shortly, and then also data uploading instructions, which I'll also go over here. And when should you monitor? Um, I mentioned that each kit contains four chloride strips. Some volunteers, as I said, um, monitor seasonally. And so if you're only gonna go out and monitor four times during the winter with your one kit that you've received, you can go out before winter weather to get your baseline reading. Go after the first winter storm when salt has been applied to the roads, and then go after a third time after the first thaw or rainstorm of the winter, and then after the next rain event. And the site that you're monitoring, you can always check in with Greg. He knows the local region um, within the Cabin John Creek watershed. But also, if you have a waterway in mind that you want to go test, um, we're not going to dictate where you should go monitor. Um, Greg might have some ideas if you're not sure where to go. But um, otherwise, it's up to you where you would like to monitor. And if you don't want to do this just during the winter time, if you'd like to expand it throughout the year, I'm happy to send you more of those chloride kits. Again, it's free. Um, you don't have to pay any money to get them. And you can monitor them throughout the year. Um, and so we recommend that you go consistently if you're gonna do that. So for instance, the first Saturday of every month. So every month, the first Saturday um, or whatever works best for your schedule. So those are sort of two different options that a lot of folks do as they're volunteering. So in order to take the sample, 
you go out with a test strip and a small jar or a cup. And the test strip here is that white thing that says Quantab with um, the orange line going down it. That's your chloride test strip. Bring a small, a small jar or cup, ideally glass or plastic. Sometimes paper cups tend to um, get on the strip and cause some different issues. Um, so glass or plastic. And then you're going to go to your stream site and you're going to add water to your jar or cup. And you're going to rinse and repeat three times. So fill your jar up, empty it out, fill your jar up, empty it out, fill your jar up, empty it out, and then fill it up about half to one inch of water remaining in your jar. The reason that we do that is so if there's any sort of residue from previous stream sampling sites, um, that's going to go away as you rinse it. And so you're getting a clean sample whenever you rinse out your jar. And then put your Quantab strip, your chloride test strip in and wait about three minutes. And what you're looking for is for that Quantab strip um, to turn black at the top. So you can see these two Quantab strips, the one on the left that's totally orange, that one has not been used yet. The one that's on the right that has that black line at the top, that means that your test is done. Whenever that line turns black, your test is complete. And you'll also notice at the bottom of that particular strip, there is sort of a, a white or yellow peak. And we'll go over that because that's actually what your reading is once you're done with your sample. So once you've taken your sample, then you're going to read what the quote unquote Quantab units are. And so for this particular one, um, go up to the very top of the peak. And so for here, the Quantab units are actually peaking just at four right here. So four Quantab units. And then once you have that reading, you're going to convert it to parts per million. This card that's here in the picture on the left, that's one of the cards that will come in your salt watch kit. And it'll show you, um, it'll have a conversion chart for how to convert your units from Quantab units to parts per million. And so for this one, you go over, you had four Quantab strip or Quantab units, you go down to four, it gives you the percentage of sodium chloride. And then over further to the right, it gives you parts per million. And so for this particular sample, that four um, Quantab units converts to 157 parts per million. And so that's the number that you're going to submit when you go to do your submission, that 157 parts per million. You'll also receive a card that looks like this, and this will show you just how to get started, how to submit your report. We use an app. It's a free app. It's called the Water Reporter app. Um, you can use it on your smartphone, and I do recommend downloading it before you go out to use your to, to your sample site um, because it does automatically add the latitude and longitude to your location. But you can also take a picture, just bring a camera out with you, take a picture of your sample when you get out there. And then you can also use your computer. Um, the website is waterreporter.org. So to sign up, again, it's a free account. So waterreporter.org. Um, or you can download the app. Um, the app icon looks like this over here to the left and set up your profile and then turn on your location services within your settings. So then Water Reporter can use your location and can automatically upload the location to your posting on Water Reporter. And then um, as you're signing up, it'll prompt you for different groups that you could follow. Make sure that you're following the Isaac Walton League of America. Um, and click follow to join just to make sure that when you're submitting posts, um, you can submit them directly to the Isaac Walton League, and then that'll automatically go up onto our database. So when you're ready to submit a report, you're out in the field, ready to take a picture, um, confirm the location of your report. You add, you can add a description here for step two. So some good examples of descriptions are this is the date, this is um, how many parts per million the Quantab strip is reading, um, it rained the day before, it's sunny today, um, this is approximately the area that I'm sampling, um, my kids were out with me, any description that you want to write um, where detail is best 
for us. And then you can add a photo to your report, and I'll show you what a good image looks like here in a moment. You want to make sure that you are capturing both the conversion chart and your Quantab strip in one photo. And then it's really, really important, step four, to share your results with the Isaac Walton League of America. So it'll be a little sort of circle at the bottom right. And then step five is submit your report. It's going to be that little check mark at the very top right of your screen to submit your report. And then that goes on to the community feed of the Water Reporter um, page. So you can scroll through and see how other people have posted or um, what's going on around you. And this is what it looks like once you've submitted a report. So again, when you're taking a photo, do try to get that entire conversion chart in there with your Quantab strip, your chloride reading. Um, and then here's a good example of a description. So they sampled, this is their second test of the day at Riffle Ford Road. Um, this date, the road was treated um, two days before. Um, and then there was a rain event after that. And so it'll tell you the date, it'll show you what watershed you're in, and then it'll also show you any tagged organizations as well at the bottom that you have tagged before submitting. So you've submitted your report, what should you do then? Take action. Um, if you find high levels of chloride, let someone know, let Greg know, you can email me. Um, I'll give my email at the end of this presentation as well. You can report those high readings to your local watershed entity. Um, again, let Greg know if you're in the Cabin John Creek watershed. You can also call your um, County Department of Environmental Protection to report high chloride levels or large levels of, um, or large salt piles as well. Um, and write a letter to the editor or your local newspaper, send a letter to your city council and share, share, share share education materials. A lot of people do not know that they're oversalting. Um, I didn't know that I was oversalting my driveway and sidewalk before I got started with this program. Um, and a lot of people who are applying salt just have no idea. A lot of applicators um, are actually paid per bag. And so there's a lot of gross oversalting practices out there. And Greg just asked, what is considered a high reading? So for our purposes, and I'll go through this here in a second, um, naturally in the environment, chloride levels can go up to 100 parts per million. Um, at 230 parts per million, um, it's considered toxic to our aquatic wildlife. At 250 parts per million, that's the EPA's secondary standard for drinking water. And so after that level is when we will actually be able to start tasting salt in the water. Um, and then there's a level, it's, um, I think it's in the 800s that is like immediately toxic to aquatic life. Um, so for our purposes, we're looking at levels um, zero to 30, uh, 30 to 100, so 100 and lower again is within that natural range in most places, 230 and above is toxic to our aquatic life. But again, um, the more that we can educate the individuals around us, the better we are, because a lot of people don't have any idea um, that road salt is even an issue in the world. So nationwide, um, and this was from about a week ago, we're probably at about 10,000 data points right now nationwide. So between the inception of the program in 2018 and 2023, um, we're now at about 10,000 data points. But last week, it was 9,825. 29% um, of those samples were considered excellent. So again, between zero and 30 parts per million, 31% of samples are considered good, so still within that natural level range between 0 and 100. 21% of samples were considered fair, so below 230 parts per million between 100 and 230, and then 19% of those samples are considered toxic, so above 230 parts per million. 
Um, these were just some graphics that I made last year for last season's results, season five. So we had over a thousand volunteers, 333 sites sampled, almost 4,000 kits distributed and samples from 24 states. Um, I believe we're currently at 14 states right now for this season. And um, 5,336 total samples. This is our biggest year yet. And I'm hoping that this season is going to be even bigger. Um, just for last year, 26.3% of samples were between 0 and 30. Excellent. 33.4% of samples are still within that, lap, that natural level were considered good. 22.3% of samples were still below 230, between 100 and 230. And then 18% of the samples were considered toxic to wildlife, so above 230 parts per million. Um, nationwide, just for this season, as of last week, we are at 800, or sorry, 785 samples, and I believe we're almost at 900 right now. So 36% are excellent, 48% are good, 11% fair, and 5% toxic. I would love for these levels to stay like this, but we also have not seen um, salt in many regions yet. Something else that I want to point out for this map too is you'll notice um, as the season progresses, but a lot of areas that are red, kind of like that Detroit area right now, those are a lot of those regions that have a lot of those impervious surfaces that Greg was talking about earlier. So lots of concrete, lots of sidewalks, lots of areas um, to collect salt and sort of run it off into our streams and a lot of areas to be salted too. So a lot of those very urban regions um, are gonna have a lot of more toxic data coming out of them um, than a lot of rural regions are. And just to quickly run through this, um, from the inception until now in Montgomery County, we've had, and this is just Montgomery County, Maryland, 1,359 data points, 6.4 are excellent, 24.4 are good, 37.2 are fair, and then 32% of those samples are toxic. Um, from last year to now, 702 data points, 5% excellent, 28% good, 42% fair, and 25% toxic. And then just to show you where Cabin John Creek Watershed is within Montgomery, Montgomery County, um, it's this region right down here, sort of at the southern tip of Montgomery County. So for Cabin John Creek results, um, over the period of time um, that the Salt Watch program has been um, in existence, 96 data points. So 11% of those are excellent, 20% are good, 41% fair, and 28% toxic. And again, Greg did mention that a lot of the areas within Cabin John Creek um, have a lot of impervious surfaces. So we're more likely to see a lot of higher um, levels within chloride data that we're getting back. And then from last year until now, 69 data points. So a lot of the samples that we've received from Cabin John Creek Watershed um, or Cabin John Watershed have been within the last year, which is really great um, that we're seeing a big uptick in data results. So 11% are excellent, 19% good, 48% fair, and then 22% of those are toxic. So, yeah, and Greg just mentioned, so Montgomery County is above your average, national average, almost 70% ferrotoxic. Um, so again, a lot of impervious surfaces um, within Montgomery County, unfortunately. So some Salt Watch advocacy resources, what you can do. Um, this is actually a web page on our website saltwatch.org, www.saltwatch.org. Um, there's a tab that says what you can do, lots of good advocacy. Um, this is a good place to start if you're finding high levels of chloride within your streams, or um, if you wanna get the word out to your state legislator, calling your local government, sharing best practices. Um, we have flyers and all sorts of things on there. 
Um, so check out this website for sort of more things that you can do and to learn a little bit more too and educate your neighbors. And I wanted to put this in here too. If you're not doing anything, even if you decide not to test um, for chloride data with us, not to monitor, which is fine. Monitoring isn't for everyone, but educating yourselves and educating your neighbors can go a really, really, really long way. So during the winter weather, shovel, clear those walkways before that snow turns to ice. Scatter salt. If you're using salt, again, that 12 ounce drinking mug, that holds enough salt to, to treat a 20 foot driveway or 10 sidewalk squares. And then a lot of folks don't know this, you can actually sweep up and reuse any of that excess salt um, after the, the snow and ice have thawed. Um, if there's any excess salt on your roadway or sidewalk, you can actually sweep that up and reuse it again later. And that keeps a lot of that salt then out of the environment. So if anyone has any questions, um, now is a good time to ask. Um, if you have any questions, you can also visit our website, which is saltwatch.org. And um, you can email me for questions too. Um, if you want bulk kits, more than one kit, you can email me to request those. Just give me your address and your name and I'll send those your way. And you can also request individual kits by going to our webpage at saltwatch.org. And I did wanna to mention too, um, for more monitoring information too, you can email monitoring at cabinjohncreek.org as well to sign up and learn more about some of the other programs that Cabin John Creek is doing too. Um, lots, of, lots of really great stuff happening out there. So, um, does anyone have any questions? Um, hi, this is Laura. Uh, thank you for um, giving the presentation. Um, I'm just curious on um, one of those sites, uh, I think it was one of the, the page just before, um, there were uh, downloads for um, handing out flyers um, to, I, I live in an apartment building and I wanted to be able to give my manager something like a guideline for um, them to give to the grounds maintenance people. Um, do you, is there anything like that available? Yeah, so there's um, the flyers that we have right now are for local, for neighbors, and then also for local businesses. Mm -hmm. um, something that we're gonna try to do a lot, especially this year, is to reach out to um, a lot of HOAs, especially, but then also building managers, property owners, those types of things too. Um, so if you send me an email, um, as we're getting all of those flyers ready, if we have new ones this year, I can certainly send those your way too. Okay, okay. and they're, they're, um, they include how-tos, not just why you should, uh, that information about why you should watch the salt. Yeah, yep. Um, and I'd, I'd probably look at more so the local business ones for especially um, like property management. Mm -hmm. things. Um, and so there are, you can look under the share best practices to road salt best practices, and that helps to reduce salt as well. So why you should do it and sort of how you can do it as well. Um, because one thing that a lot of business owners and property owners are worried about is liability. And so if I'm not putting these tons and tons and tons of pounds of road salt down, I'm worried that somebody is going to slip and fall and then sue me as a result of that. And so that's a lot of like the worst nightmare for a lot of these folks. Um, but there are ways to do it properly and ways to reduce your road salt as well. And there are a couple of folks who are um, smart salt applicators within Montgomery County. We did a training in August. And so I believe there's a link on our webpage to those folks as well. Um, and if there isn't, I can send you some of their information. Um, and they do service Montgomery County. And we're going to do another training. We're planning on doing another training probably next August as well for even more people who are interested in getting certified as a certified smart salter um, within the region. Okay, great. Thanks. And your email is is the salt watch at yeah. okay great yeah right. Thank yeah you. so feel free to email me um 
we're constantly making new flyers and updating things. Um, so if it's not on our web page, it's either on deck or um, we just haven't quite distributed it yet. Um, but we're always always making more things. So please email me um, if you don't see something on our webpage um, that you think would be really helpful for your local community or your residents to get the word out. Okay, great. Thank you. Great question. Let's see. I had to I had jotted a note here just to go back a bit on reporting salt issues. Let's say you see a pile of salt on the road. Um, you can actually call 311, which is Montgomery County's hotline, and um, ask to basically speak to somebody in environmental protection. Um, they'll route your call, and then you can basically report the location of the um, salt pile. My understanding is that Montgomery County would send somebody out to kind of scoop that up and um, just to get it off the roadway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's really good information. And we will have soon, I'm not sure the date, but we are launching a Montgomery County Salt Watch page as well. So stay tuned for that. That'll be launched um, probably within the next couple of months, definitely within the next year. And so all of that information will be on that as well locally for you folks too. Um, but yeah, so for Montgomery County, call 311. Um, you can also use the water reporter app to report those salt spills as well. Um, that won't go to the county, so no one will necessarily take care of it if it goes to water reporter, um, but just to document it too, that goes a long way to let, letting people know what's happening in your local community. But calling the city um, or the county government directly will make that happen faster, certainly. And they're pretty, pretty good and pretty responsive too. So um, they want to do the right thing. Yeah, I've had good success with that. <laughs> you can pretty much call it for anything. <laughs> um, thanks, Abby, for the presentation. It's great. And um, we'll keep getting the word out, especially to residents who can control the amount of salt that they're putting down for the ice that uh, should be coming, we'll see. <laughs> we might have a mild winter, I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, and we will have a recording of this. I'll send this to Greg and I'm gonna stop recording right now before I forget. And um, 